Dark shadows stepped out of the forest near the point where they landed. One last pang of intense fear, a grabbing for Tommy guns and hand grenades. Then the familiar French voices reached them. They were a rescue column from the nearby post of Myung Bu, which had been alerted to their presence by the plane. But now, the pent-up emotions of the past two weeks, the nervous and physical exhaustion of the hell which they had just survived, caught up with them. Payroll and his men collapsed on the spot, crying like children, unable to walk another step. They had been given up for dead long ago by everyone, and Bijard had requested posthumous citations for their brave rear guard fight at Myung Chen. Of the 84 men who had defended Myung Chen, 16 reached the Black River. Master Sergeant Payroll had still carried his champagne bottle. Now that is an excerpt from Bernard Fall's 1961 book, Street Without Joy, which covers the French debacle in Indochina. Now, the French war in Indochina is a largely quiet war in our historical mind. It doesn't speak to us loudly. It's it's listed well behind the Korean War and even the War of 1812 and the American mindset because it is foreign. It is not assigned importance to us. But the lessons learned in the French debacle in Indochina are extremely applicable not only to the Second Indochina War, which to us is known as the Vietnam War, the American Vietnam War, as well as counterinsurgency and politics in general. Now, Myung Chen was just a little outpost in North Vietnam near the Black River. And for 80 men, three bunkers at Myung Chen ended up being the fight for their lives. And for very, very many more Viet Minh soldiers, it was the place where they ended up dying. But if you try to find Myung Chen in the history books or you go to Google or Wikipedia or YouTube or whatever source you choose and you try to research Myung Chen, you're going to find no reference to it outside of Street Without Joy by Bernard Fall. So today we're going to dive into the Battle of Myung Chen. We're going to give you a little bit of context to it, let you know what happened and let you know how they ended up crossing that Black River and being saved by those Frenchmen. Before you start to understand the Battle of Myung Chen, you have to understand some of the characters involved. So one of the biggest ones, and not just the Battle of Myung Chen being the officer who commanded and ordered the set-piece battle to take place, but as well as the French war in not only Indochina, but later Algeria, is Marcel Bijard. Now, Marcel Bijard is an extremely fascinating French historical figure. Let me tell you why. Before World War II, Bijard was nothing more than a banker. But on June 25th, 1940, he ended up being captured by the Germans as a low-ranking junior NCO uh, and spent a lot of time in a Stalag, which is a German POW camp. Following his third attempt to escape, he managed to make his way to the unoccupied zone in France, and from there he went on to Senegal, which is one of the French territories in Africa. But to give you a background on this guy, third attempt escaping from a Nazi prison camp. We like him. Now, at this point, future general Marcel Bijard had made it out of a German prison camp. He was in Africa, and he said, what am I going to do? And so he joined the Free French Forces. And through the Free French Forces, which were the, the forces left fighting against Nazi Germany from French colonial areas in simplicity, uh, he joined the British commandos in England. And with the British commandos, they gave him an opportunity where he could parachute in in early 1944 near the border with uh, Andorra. And what he did in France was he ran an unconventional warfare cell. So he did guerrilla, used guerrilla tactics, uh, fought asymmetrical warfare, would ambush German supply lines, trains, and the like, and ended up actually getting a British award for his service um, in this unconventional manner. So it just shows you that he's a real-life Inglorious bastard, if you wanted to put it in movie terms, which is pretty, pretty fascinating. And this is prior to the war in Indochina. When the war ended in Europe in 1945, Bijard was sent almost immediately to Indochina in the middle of 1945. Uh, and he was put in command of a company that was part of the 23rd Colonial Infantry Regiment. And to use a French word, we're going to use uh, portmanteau. The 23rd Colonial Infantry Regiment was a portmanteau unit. It consisted of men who were from different parts of French colonies. So you had some people from Indochina, you had some people from Algeria, you had some people from Morocco, as well as French officers. 
Come 1952, Bijard is the commander of the 6th Colonial Parachute Battalion. So he's a battalion commander. The 6th Colonial Parachute Battalion, to give you a little background, is obviously a French battalion, but the population of the battalion is about half French and half Vietnamese. So it speaks to his leadership that uh, because this was a high-performing unit, Um, that he had an ability, a tact, to deal with the Vietnamese culture and the French culture and act as a bridge between both as a military leader. Uh, He's well regarded in French history. He'd be almost equivalent to a Patton or a a more modern George Washington in the French military historical mindset to give you some some context that might make a little more sense as an American. The second character we're going to introduce you to is French Master Sergeant Payroll. So we don't know much about him. He's 34 years old. He's from Verdun. And October 20th, which is the day that the Battle of Myungchun begins, was the birthday of his young daughter back in Verdun because he had kept a bottle of champagne for such an occasion to have to himself. But as you'll hear in just a moment, he ended up keeping that bottle of champagne and saving it for a more spectacular moment he wished he would enjoy and he did enjoy, which was surviving this set piece battle. Now, to the battle. By October 1952, Marcel Bijard is commanding the 6th Colonial Parachute Battalion. And commanding that battalion, they had done a salient, or essentially a bulge, just like the Battle of the Bulge, into Viet Minh territory in northern Vietnam. But by the 20th of October, they are on the retreat. And on the evening of the 20th, Bijard's column reaches Myung Chen, the little hill outpost commanded by Master Sergeant Payroll. Now they get to the outpost and all they have is one small bunker constructed by tree logs. And they have two small barracks for the Vietnamese soldiers. And he says, look here, Payroll, there's an entire division, which is about six times the size of uh, the parachute battalion chasing us right now they are an hour behind and if we're going to make it to the black river we need three hours of time and so what he says is i need you to hold out at myung chen and do whatever you can to stop this vietnamese advance or at the very least because you're not going to be able to stop it delay it now myung chen was so scarcely defended they didn't even have barbed wire like a a military necessity, a must. They only had sharpened sticks. And payroll 34 on his daughter's birthday just said, bien mon commandant, which means fucking Roger, sir. Let's do it. So come later on the evening of the 20th, only an hour after the departure of the paratroopers, just on time since the Viet Minh were only an hour behind him, Mortar shells begin to rain down on Master Sergeant Payroll's Myung Chin. The enemy had established himself within firing distance and hadn't even been detected by any of the patrols going out, a, a commonality among the French war in Indochina. So what did the communist troops, the Viet Minh, do? But they did human wave attack after attack after attack. And so the main thrust of the attack was directed against a southern bunker, the one that was previously finished, where a small fold of the train provided shelter from French automatic weapons. And this was followed by a direct assault on the unfinished blockhouse, which was taken by successive waves of grenadiers who were communist troops armed only with hand grenades. So they weren't even given rifles. They weren't given ammo. Uh, Later, you see this in the American Vietnam War with with grenadiers and... um, suicide bombers as well as Vietnamese sappers they're unarmed except for handheld explosives and they in many ways expect to die on their attack Um, they blew up the wire and bamboo obstacles and the wire obstacles um, excuse me the bamboo sharpened obstacles and then they took out the BAR automatic rifle teams which is essentially a, a machine gun position scores of the grenadiers died or were wounded in the attempt but the falling waves just jumped into the position over the bodies of their dead or dying comrades so quite literally the Vietnamese grenadiers were trampling the weak and, and hurtling the dead um, Young Chen battered and smoking still held for three hours at 2200 10 p.m., 
The situation had become hopeless, and all the heavy weapons had either run out of ammunition or had been destroyed, and the garrison was about to be crushed simply by the sheer weight of enemy bodies falling on top of these men in the trenches and emplacements. Their death or capture in Myung Chen would in no way delay the Viet Minh any longer, so payroll decided an attempt to break out. They'd already booby-trapped the remaining bunker and reserve ammunition, and they'd fired all their weapons at top speed, and the men made a break which for a trail which they had recently hacked out and hopefully, they hoped, would still be unknown to the enemy. His long shot paid off, and in the pitch-black night, they knew their way better than the Viet Minh and soon were, mercifully, swallowed up by the jungle. When the survivors counted themselves as dawn broke, there remained three Frenchmen, so one Frenchman was lost because they started with four, if you remember, and about 40 tribesmen. And if you remember, they had 80. So you have over 50% casualties at this point, which is just horrendous. Um, and now began a deadly game of hide and seek. For the enemy had sent two companies in their pursuit. And so a company is probably about 120 to 150 men chasing after these, these 43 men in the jungles of North Vietnam. And the chase was to last 12 days and cover more than 200 kilometers of jungle involving river crossings, which were made more difficult by the fact that one of the French could not swim and the scaling of mountain chains that were over 8,000 feet high. One of the French privates, one of the three who survived, would soon have to walk barefoot since his feet, bleeding and swollen, no longer even fit into his boots. So just imagine being a young 19-year-old French private, 1952, you're in Indochina, and you had just ran into one of your French military heroes. You ran into Marcel Bajard, and he had told you that you need to fight to the death at this small mountain outpost, and you barely make it out alive. And now you have a 200-kilometer game of hide-and-seek with the Viet Minh who know the train better than you and are local to it, and you can't even wear your boots. Woof. That's a woof. So on the second day... The um, intervention of a roving fighter bomber saved the troop from being uh, completely annihilated as they were found and ambushed by the Viet Minh, but they still lost 10 men. On the third day, they ran out of food, but the jungle-wise natives were able to find some meager corn cobs and roots, which provided some subsistence. At every halt, they'd vainly attempt to contact French posts on the SCR 300 radio, which was, miraculously enough, still in working order. Whatever French posts were left were still beyond the range of the transmitter at this point, so they were still walking. One evening, a seemingly French voice replied and indicated a a coordinate on the map to a drop zone in the north of their present march route. It seemed almost like a miracle. A hot debate ensued. Did the message come from the French long-range commando groups permanently operating behind communist lines which they could fly out wounded and receive supplies through small airfields they created in the jungle, or was the message a trap set by the Viet Minh, which they used to induce French supply aircraft to parachute them supplies destined for commando groups or to get planes uh, close enough that they could shoot them down? As unpopular it was at the time, payroll decided not to identify his own party and not to reply to the radio call. It turned out later that payroll had been right. The transmitter had been a communist trap. So by not answering this miracle call in a time of stress and not falling victim to his own emotions, payroll pulled out for the boys and saved the whole group, which is, it's just a fascinating chance, you know, um, it's, it's not luck. It's calculated decisions made by a NCO to not fall victim to this trap and not fall victim to your emotions when you're four or five days into a hunt or being hunted with no food, scarce water, and you think you have a miracle on your hands and you have the audacity to go, no, we're going to keep walking. Like, what a man. So near Bat Chien, which is one mountain range away from the Black River, they nearly fell on top of Viet Minh platoon that was bivouacking, which means just sleeping on the ground along the path. And as they crept up, I mean, it's pitch black, triple canopy jungle. They realize that they're within feet of a Viet Minh platoon, and they just stop, freeze, don't move. And they sat there for hours 
and waited for these Viet men to leave. And then on November 5th, the last crest was climbed and the blue sky on the other side of the mountain was visible and they could see the Black River. Now at this point, I mean, the battle was on October 20th and it's November 5th. They'd been going for days and days. Um, And a reddish brown, swift and treacherous, but safety lay on the other side of this river. There still was a steep descent to the riverbank and steep descents in the jungle, but the men were happy to fall more often than walk uh, down the hills. And by 1600, they reached the valley bottom. Once they got to the valley bottom, out of nowhere, this Vietnamese tribesman comes out of the woods, or the jungle, excuse me, and says, you cannot pass during daytime. You must go back into the trees. There are many Viet Minh patrols along the river, but your men are on the other side. You stay here till nightfall, and I'll come back with some rice and guide you. And payroll is like, dude, bet. This sounds like a good deal. But the question was, could he be trusted? And even the Vietnamese locals, which were from the same tribe as the man, did not know because the Vietnam men would pay great, great amounts um, for French captured or um, for Vietnamese tribesmen who were captured that were fighting against the uh, Viet men. So if this villager was to report them, he would be rich for the rest of his life. And so they go, should we trust him? You know, we didn't trust those radio calls before, but they decide to trust him. And at nightfall, he comes back with a, a bucket of thick, gluey rice, standard food staple of the mountains of North Vietnam. And they wolf down the rice. They drink the muddy water of the river. And the tribesman goes, hey, you know, the French are no longer on the other side. The Vietnamese had busted them back, but sorry, I know where to cross. We're going to have to wait another day, but we'll figure it out. We'll get you a boat. And these men cried with frustration. They were so close to safety. I mean, they had been evading the Viet Minh for 12 days in the jungle. They had had to scound for their own food. They'd been drinking muddy water. They had been ambushed. They had almost walked upon a platoon and they were just a river crossing away from safety and they missed it. And then on the evening of the next day, um, or just before the evening, excuse me, they noticed a plane in the sky and they got out their French tricolor, their little flag, and they held it up. And the plane swooped down low and it dropped a message in a canister and says, saw you. Put away that flag and stay out of sight. We'll notify the buddies opposite of you. Bon chance. So they were saying that, hey, we see you. We got you, boys. We're going to get you out of here. And on the evening of that day, that's when they crossed over in the makeshift rafts that the native had given them. And once they got to the other side of the riverbank, They were happy, but they were so scared. And almost in a religious sense, um, in the way Payroll describes it, he'd lost his field glasses and one of his sergeants, the shoes, to the river. And what they saw that was was a sort of proprietary gift to the river gods. Like, hey, you let us cross your river. We got to pay something back a little bit to you. And this is where we get our intro part where we said the dark shadows stepped out of the forest near the point where they landed one last pang of insane fear grabbing for tommy guns and hand grenades then a familiar french voice reached them they were the rescue column from the nearby post of myung bu which had been alerted to their presence by the plane earlier that day but now the pent-up emotions of the last two weeks the nervous and physical exhaustion of the hell which they had just survived caught up with them payroll and his men collapsed on the spot crying like children unable to walk another step they had requested posthumous citations for their brave rear guard at Myung Chen. Of the 84 men who had defended Myung Chen, 16 reached the Black River. And Master Sergeant Payroll still carried his champagne bottle. Wow. So 84 men defended Myung Chen against an entire division, which is thousands and thousands of men, and only 16 ended up making it out dying of starvation, thirst, battle, ambush, exposure. And that is what happened at Myung Chen. And now the reason we talk about things like this is because they are not part of our common historical mindset. They are not famous. There will never be a Band of Brothers style series or a famous movie or even a docuseries on anything 
like the Battle of Myeongchan. For 84 men, this was their huckleberry. This was the largest event that was probably going to happen in their collective lives. And for all but 16 of them, it's where they ended up dying. Uh, battles like this, there was hundreds in the French Indochina War. There was tens of them every month. And in the American Vietnam War, there was thousands of them as well. The same thing is true for Korea. The same thing is true for the Iran Iraq conflict. The same thing is true for almost any conflict. There's thousands of small skirmishes. There's many large battles. And not everything has the historical importance or the uh, popularity of something like D Day or Gettysburg. But the stories and the narratives are important nonetheless. And that's why we're here to talk about these and bring them to the forefront of our you know, historical prefrontal cortex. Make them something that we think about and something that we consider. I mean, imagine, you can only imagine the extreme harsh conditions of running through the jungle barefooted for 12 days as a 19-year-old in Indochina hiding from gorillas and being ambushed multiple times and crossing rivers. And it's something that goes about almost unwritten to the history books. And what it makes you think is, how many times has this happened before? How many times have extraordinary circumstances or extraordinary stories of grief and strife and triumph and personal emotion gone written? And how many have been largely unrecorded? A little food for thought right there. Now to close out the podcast, we have a viewer mail section. And since we have no viewer mail, if you would like to uh, send us any viewer mail or comments, it uh, you can find us on at military history underscore on Instagram. But today we have a viewer text from Oliver in Bend, Oregon, which is a uh, flexing arm emoji. Thanks, Oliver. If you enjoyed this podcast or would like to hear more mini military history podcasts, send us a DM. Let me know what you would like to hear. Give me a topic. Um, Things that we plan on covering in the near future are a history of airborne operations in World War II, including those in the Pacific, the Street Without Joy, that the book Street Without Joy is named after, um, French dissonance in the French Indochina War, the book The Jungle is Neutral, and... A really, really interesting topic I find, which is bayonet charges after World War II, because they're pretty rare, and they're pretty violent, and they're pretty fascinating. Uh, Our Instagram, again, is at militaryhistory underscore. Um, There is, for all the young kids out there, a TikTok with the same at, as well as a YouTube channel, which this will be uploaded to as well military history. We can find all of your favorite 1980s documentaries on Mac V. Sog, as well as uh, the number one D-Day Normandy documentary on YouTube, which was definitely totally not pirated from uh, the History Channel. Thank you. Thanks for listening.